and the campaign has definitely escalated. You know, I mean, it started out with just the most polite of polite letters, and then it went to kind of like lawsuits, demos at the lab, then demos at home, and then this year, there was even like direct action. You never heard about that? In 2003, local animal rights activists and university students launched a campaign against the University of Utah, demanding an end to research that uses primate subjects, primate vivisection. Primate Freedom Project is actually a national nonprofit organization. I founded the local chapter of Utah Primate Freedom in 2003 when I was a freshman at the University of Utah, and it's dedicated to ending the use of primates in research uh, at the University of Utah campus. Specifically, there are only four primate researchers that um, are currently using primates in, in research at the University of Utah, so if those four people were to quit, that would effectively end the program. So our most active campaign right now is to try and get those four researchers to quit through public outreach and through protest and also through some degree of direct pressure on the institution and on those researchers. We also have an ongoing effort to acquire public records so that we can tell the public this is how primates are being used, so we can learn more about the day-to-day -day operations to discover where the weaknesses of this organization are and exploit those weaknesses to end the program and to educate the public. How many animals have to die? Vivisection is a lie! How many animals have to die? Almost a year ago, last November, we held like a FOIA party. FOIA is the Freedom of Information Act. About two dozen people all submitted records requests to the U. Well, I had a partial denial. They said that they would give me the titles and salaries of all of the employees at the research center, but not the names, which is pointless, because if you want to find out who is the one violating the FDA laws or regulations, and the whole point is knowing <laughs> who they are, so you can hold them accountable. So we decided to, mine was a good test case, and we appealed that. We were denied again. We appealed it to the U one more time, and then we were denied again, and so we went to the State Records Committee, Half of their defense at the State Records Committee was talking about how I was horrible and untrustworthy and I was a terrorist. They didn't want me there, obviously, and I don't know. I just, I would see the campus or think about going to class and I would just have no desire <laughs> whatsoever. Just They said some really terrible things about me. And then they gave us a partial denial, but they, I still couldn't have the names. The next step from here would be to district court. The next step after that is serving the other party, which we have four months to do. That deadline is in a week and a half. We still don't have a lawyer, but the good news is that if we could find a lawyer, it goes in front of a judge who I don't think will be quite as easily motivated by terror or by terrorism and fear. You know, I think that the judge will be able to look at the law and be like, come on, I've seen crazier records requests than this. I can't get those individual life stories from the University of Utah because basically they won't give it to me. They're starting to win these court decisions. We want to know how many dogs and cats you have and what their birthdays were. and get an idea if their lab's expanding or growing. We're probably talking fewer than 10 pages here. They wanted $780. Other institutions don't do this, by the way. This is a, something that's unique to the University of Utah. I think the main reason the University of Utah won't is because there's a campaign against them. So they don't want to give us ammunition. They don't want us to go to the media and say, look at what this monkey's going through. We just got these records. When I read the records of the daily lives of monkeys, those elicit the the greatest feelings of anger and sadness. And I've got those from other institutions all the time. Basically, you request veterinary reports, daily care logs, autopsy report, any medical record, any protocol of any experiment that monkey X is involved in. And that'll give you a glimpse into what that one monkey's life is like. And I did that for one monkey at the University of Utah, where I found out that that monkey was shipped from the California Primate Center to the University of Utah, probably for Audie Leventhal's experiments. And he had already chewed off two of his fingers because he had got such severe depression from living in life isolated. He also had mild kyphosis, which is an irregular curvature of the spine from being hunched over in a cage for his whole life. He had had his blood drawn on a weekly basis while he was in California Primate Center, which blood draws at a primate center are really invasive, and then ultimately was involved in neurological research where he had electrodes hooked up into his brain and he was strapped into a chair and experimented on while he was conscious. He also suffered from chronic diarrhea because he's malnourished inside the lab. They essentially feed them dog food. So those are some of the records I like to get. I can't really get those from the University of Utah anymore, those glimpses of one monkey's life. On October 31st, 2007, Utah Primate Freedom missed their deadline to serve the University of Utah. As far as animals and labs, I don't think it'll affect that one bit. The campaign against the, the U of U goes on and it'll keep going on as long as there's primates there. Utah Primate Freedom believes that one closed window will just open ten more. 
Child Parenting Freedom's most controversial thing we've done without question is the use of protesting outside the homes of researchers. Basically we would go have a protest out in front of their house to let the whole neighborhood know what they did for a living, what kind of person they were, just so everyone was aware of what was right next door. Because a lot of people weren't aware and they were really glad that we were out there. Protesting outside the homes of researchers actually did not start until January of 2005. We used to do demonstrations on campus. We did a march on campus back in 2004 that like 85 people were at actually. It was a pretty huge march. And it was great. Um, you know, I, again, I think the general move went away from those towards Mord's home demonstrations because people want to be effective. But after all those things continued to fail, after they refused to debate us, after the protests on campus failed to result in any sort of additional meaningful discussion on the part of the researchers, and after the University of Utah decided to lobby the state legislature to change the law against us, we realize that these sort of prescribed means of social change are doomed to fail. And that's precisely why the University of Utah wants us to do it. They want us to stay on campus. They want us to hand around our meaningless petitions because it doesn't come into conflict with their interests. They can keep vivisecting all day long while we hand out petitions. So we realize that we need to do something that they're really not going to like. The blood! The blood! The blood is on your hands! It's not just an institution that's torturing animals. It's not just the University of Utah or the Animal Resource Center that's torturing monkeys inside that lab, but it's also individuals like Alessandra Angelucci and Adi Leventhal. Those are individuals that are directly profiting off of the suffering and death of monkeys. We don't want them to be able to go home and at the end of the day and feel good about themselves. Like we want to bring attention to the fact that what they do for a living is terrible and we want everyone else to know about it. You know what, Dr. Lane is in Australia right now. He's in Australia? Yeah. Okay, would you like a leaflet and you can pass this along to him when you get back to okay. him? Are you aware of the what type of research he does with the monkeys? Um, you know what, I'm actually a friend of the family. Gotcha. Okay, so. well when he gets back in town, um, just pass that along to him and we'll just spread the word to his neighbors here today. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you for your time. So we wanted to call attention to these people as individuals, as being morally bankrupt characters in our society, and the fact that we're paying their salaries with our public money. We will never compromise all your money, all your lives! We have no way of knowing what they're doing inside of the labs. They're behind this curtain, and we have no way of getting inside of it, even legally. It's just really frustrating. It's like kind of the only way we have to hold them accountable for what they do. And it seemed kind of like a waste of time to go to a lab and show people photos of what they're about to go do at work. So instead we took those same posters with those same photos and went in front of their homes and showed their neighbors. This is what your neighbor does. That they didn't like. After running numerous campaigns for public discussion about primate research, Utah Primate Freedom has only hit walls of secrecy in the form of polite refusals, police arrests, and actual legislation. One ordinance in Salt Lake City now requires the 100 yards subject to protest distance during home demonstrations. I think that protesting does do a lot just because it gets other people involved. Audi Leventhal's neighbors are horrified about the kind of person he is. They don't want him in their neighborhood, even if not seeing results right away. I've seen it happen. One home demo and the primate of the sector quit. That's a pretty big deal. I think it could easily happen even if we kept the pressure on, especially Audi Leventhal. I think he's really easily winnable. So I just think that the more you can keep people involved and keep things positive and more likely you are to succeed. I seriously think that it's hard for our movement to measure how many people we've turned away from the profession. I think there really are probably some people that have decided not to be vivisectors because they don't want to deal with this headache. I think that people should look at themselves to bring solutions to these problems and say what can I do or what can me and 10 other people do to create change. And I think the answer is, in short, get in their face. Yeah, some activists, no, I don't know who did it, no one does, but they vandalize like property that he owns. I really can't believe you never heard this. On two separate occasions, like early this year, like around February or January was one time, and then like around May or June, they like smashed windows, glued locks, spray painted, vandalized the jacuzzi in one of them. I can't believe you never heard about that. That really surprises me. This is just this year, yeah.